Good morning, Cornerstone. It's an honor to be with you this morning. And uh, today is Palm Sunday. But I'm not really going to talk about the events that happened over 2,000 years ago on Palm Sunday. What I want to do is take you back even before that, back into the Old Testament, back to one of my favorite books. It's the book of Ruth. It's my favorite because it's a short book. It has four chapters. When I was growing up, my father would require us to read scripture at home. And I remember the first time I discovered the book of Ruth, I, I bragged to my dad, yeah, I read the whole, I read a whole book of the Bible, the whole book of Ruth, all four chapters. So I want to take you to the book of Ruth. Today, I want to talk about our destiny at the end of the tunnel. We've been walking through this COVID journey for the last 10, 12 months now. And what we're starting to see is there's some destiny at the end of the tunnel. God always has a destiny for us at the end of the tunnel. And I, I want to just draw our attention to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, there's a powerful story of destiny. It involves a man and it involves a woman. And her name is Naomi and his name is Elimelech. And they're parents, and they live in this town of Bethlehem. And you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the town of Bethlehem. Well, Elimelech and Naomi are Israelites. They're followers of God. They're obedient to the laws that God gave them. They're a devout family with two sons. And everything in life was going really, really well for them. And this is where the story begins. The book of Ruth in verse 1 starts out this way. There was a famine, a pandemic, as you, were, as you would have it in the land. A famine in the land. This story begins with difficulty in a family that was full of life, full of hope. They were full of promise. And maybe, perhaps, that's your story. Maybe that's what, where you were at some point. Suddenly, there was this dramatic distress, and this family is running for their lives. What happened, actually, because there was a famine, there was no bread in their house. There was no food. It's kind of ironic because the, the, the word Bethlehem is Bethlehem. It literally means house, Beth, of Lehem, bread, house of bread. And there was no bread in the house of bread. Naomi had nothing to feed her family. She was empty-handed in terms of food. They were desperate as a family. Elimelech had a farm, but there was no crop because of the famine. There was no other job for him. There was no source of income to turn to. So they moved to Moab, a place that there was food and maybe some part-time work. They were distressed. Now they had moved to Moab. Now, were they, now they were displaced. They were living in a strange culture. Life in Moab. They were not in their own home. Naomi had dreamed of a beautiful home. She had watched it on HGTV, Hebrew Garden Television. And all the wonderful pieces that she had gathered from the home sense, maybe like you have, to make your home perfect, they were all gone. She was displaced. Instead, now she's living in Moab, in a land where the Moab, where the Moab people, the Moabites, they killed their own children. They did shocking and disgusting acts that God disapproved of. In fact, God had told the Israelite people, stay away from Moab. They had to learn a new language. They had to learn new and strange con con culture. It was high impact culture shock. It was a tremendous blow to their normal family life. And maybe that's what you've been experiencing lately. So there was distress. There was displacement. And to add insult to injury, there was death. The story goes on and it says that Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. That's a true true tragedy. You see, Elimelech was Naomi's husband, the love of her life, the father of her children, her confidant, her closest friend, and now he is gone. And to add insult to injury to her displacement and her distress, not one, but both of her sons die as well. And all that left Naomi with was her two widowed daughter-in-laws, two Moabites, Naomi is left without her children, and certainly she has no future prospects. All she has is these two daughter-in-laws, and, and you're familiar with them perhaps because of the book of Ruth. The one's name is Ruth, and the other's name is Orpah. 
And as you're reading this story, you become gripped by the events, gripped by the personalities. As I read this again this week, I was, I was trying to read it through fresh eyes, and I was trying to think, how is this displaced, distressed, pandemic, famine-ridden woman going to survive? She's not a rock star. She's not a CEO. She's not some kind of leader. She's us. She's you, and she's me. Each one of us can identify with some aspect of this story. Maybe it's Naomi's story. Maybe it's Orpah's story. Maybe it's Ruth's story. You see, there's awkward pieces happening all through this story. Let, let, let's continue. T today, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. Now, <laughs> not some blind leap into the darkness, but a tangible step toward refocusing your life towards the destiny that God has for you. You see, everything's been tossed around in the last year. Your life has been messed with. Your emotions have been frazzled. Your finances, some, your finances are in shambles. But today, I want you to understand that God has a destiny for you. So, let's come back to the story. What is Naomi going to do? She, 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 she's, she's desperate. She's in distress. What would you do? Well, the first thing she does is she takes a courageous step of faith. You see, your destiny is not a matter of chance. Your destiny is a matter of choice. Now, Naomi, she hears that the famine has ended back in Israel. And with no reason to stay in Moab, she packs up nothing because she had nothing. And she leaves. She begins her journey back to Bethlehem. She begins her steps of faith. She wants to put the past behind her. Her heart can't bear any more grief. It can't bear any more loss. And so she wants to return to what she thinks will be at least something that she's familiar with. Perhaps she will be able to once again worship her God, Jehovah. You see... When you decide to worship, what it does is it refocuses your life. Worship will always refocus your life. It's a key step in Naomi's for journey. It's a key step to your journey. It's a return to worshiping God. Returning to the place where you first encountered a loving God. Maybe, maybe you're watching this morning and you're thinking, yeah, I remember that moment. That first moment I encountered a loving, uh, a God who, who actually was real and, and who cared for me. What do you need to do? Let me ask you this. What do you need to do this morning to reconnect with God? Perhaps you need today to go for a walk and just talk with God and say, God, I, I, I've missed you. Because God is actually waiting for that discussion with you, that conversation, that reconnection. As much as you miss the, the comfort of having people around you, God wants your comfort around him as well. Now, here's a strange twist to the story. As, as Naomi's leaving Moab, headed back, suddenly she looks behind her and she hears this calling and it's, it's Ruth and Orpah. And they're coming after her and they're saying, Naomi, wait, wait. And she has unwanted company. And, and they're, the girls, these two daughter-in-laws, are traveling with her, and she's going, girls, please, go back. Don't, you, you don't want to come with me. I, I can't even look after myself. How am I going to care for you? What am I going to do? And she pleads this with them, and she says, please go back to your mother's home. And out of kindness, she grants that they would remarry because she was the mother-in-law. She could grant this. And she goes, I, I bless you. I, I release you. Please go and remarry. My sons are gone. Your husbands are gone. Go and remarry. And it's here, it's interesting. At this point, Orpah abandons Naomi and returns to her mother. We never hear about Orpah again in scripture, ever. Let me say this. When people can walk away out of your life, let them. I'll say that again. When people can walk away and walk out of your life, let them. I can't 
and I won't care for people that don't want to be in my life anymore. I can't make that decision. That is their decision to, to make. I have lost people that meant the world to me. And I want you to know I'm still doing fine. They've walked out of my life. I can't change that. Your destiny is never tied to people who leave. Don't be changed to the, to the past. Don't be changed to the past because you refuse to let someone go. Walk forward. So that's Orpah. The other one is Ruth. Now, Ruth, she's stubborn. And she's determined to go with Naomi because she senses something. She senses Naomi has this special relationship with a God, a God that's different than the gods of Moab. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth realizes the God that Naomi serves isn't fearful. He's not offensive. He's not degrading like the, the gods of Moab. Instead, Naomi's God is merciful. <laughs> He's kind. He's, He's loving. And Naomi pleads with Ruth and says, Ruth, please go back to your mother. And she doesn't do this once. She does, doesn't do it twice. But three times she says, Ruth, go back to your mom. Go back to your mom. And Ruth refuses. And instead, what Ruth does is she says to Naomi what I believe are the most powerful terms in the phrase in terms of human love that's recorded in Scripture. Let, let me read this portion to you. Ruth says this to Naomi. Don't urge me to leave you. Don't urge me to turn away from you. Because where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. That is Ruth's confession of faith. You see, your worship will always determine your focus. And Ruth decided to worship God. She recognizes her destiny is tied to a living God. She's not tied to Naomi's spirit or to Naomi's flesh. She's tied to Naomi's spirit. Each one of you, myself included, we have to connect our destiny. We've got to connect it to someone, to something, to a church, to a family. You have to get seriously focused. 44 years ago, I stood at an altar and I connected my destiny to my wife. So at that point, I wasn't Mark any longer. I became Mark and Wendy. In my family, we refer to us as Mark and Wendy. And her side of the family, it's Wendy and Mark, of course. You see, you have to get focused on what you're going to connect your destiny to. Then she says this, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the de Lord deal with me every, ever so severely if anything but death ever separates us. When Naomi realized Ruth was going with her, she stopped urging her, and she heads home. She's headed back to Bethlehem. You see, the second step is, the first step is to focus on worship. The second step is to be honest about the reality of your situation. Now you see, it's been about 10 years since Naomi had left Bethlehem. And as she begins to come back into the city, the, 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 local, the local ladies were all gathered at the, at the, at the Bethlehem Starbucks. And they saw, they saw Naomi walking back into town. And they, 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 they were looking at each other and going, oh, don't look, don't look, look, here, here she comes. Here comes Naomi. Look, look, oh, oh my goodness. She's still got that same coat on. Oh, look, her shoes, what a mess. And then they called out to her and say, Naomi, Naomi, is that you? And Naomi turned to them and she said to them, don't call me Naomi. You see, because in Hebrew, the word Naomi means pleasant. It means my joy. She says, don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara. Mara means bitter. She said, because God has dealt with me bitterly. I left here full, but I am coming back empty. I want to say something to you today. Nothing just happens. The events in your life, they didn't just happen. Hear me carefully. At this point, the situation is dire. Naomi has lost everything. She's lost her home. She's lost her husband. She's lost her son. She lost Orpah. 
How will she go on? She's without hope. Naomi has gone from full to empty. And every one of you, including me, have had this happen in our life. When suddenly you realize I am on this path, that I've gone from full to empty. Now, I'm not trying to be negative this morning. I'm trying to be as transparent as I can. Some of you have lost your health. Maybe your family, finances. Maybe you've lost your faith. And maybe you've lost your ability to worship and your hope is gone. And this is where this story comes to a crashing halt. But as you look closely at the story, something else is happening. Something that's so ordinary. Something that's so mundane. It's not a huge spectacle. It's not some revival service, some healing crusade. It's not a Hollywood production. No. This is what chapter 1, verse 20 of Ruth says. Now, Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was happening. So what? As the barley harvest. Well, just when you thought there was nothing left, the barley harvest is happening. It's just beginning. You see, the barley harvest is the first harvest of the season. The first fruits of the harvest. Nothing just happens. You see, here in Canada, we plant barley in the fall. And the barley in the fall starts and it comes up very small. It might come up an inch or two, nice and green. You'll drive by a field in southwestern Ontario and you'll see, you'll see green fields in the fall. Everything else is turning turning brown and the leaves are falling but these fields it looks like fields of grass and they're all turning green and then the snow comes and they're all buried and you think oh that all dies but then what happens is when the warm weather starts to come that barley starts to grow and the first harvest of the season is the barley harvest you see when everything else is withering away the barley harvest was just beginning God has a destiny waiting for you now how do you go from empty to full. Well, let's, let's talk about that. You take a step of faith. You be honest about the reality of your situation. And you take the focus off of yourself and put it on those around you. So Naomi and her daughter-in-law, they return to Bethlehem. And this is the game changer. Naomi begins to focus all of her attention on Ruth. Ruth asks Naomi, I, I need to go to work. Well, in that culture, women didn't necessarily go to work. Well, they did, but not in jobs that you would want to talk about. And Ruth crosses a couple of cultural norms here. But Naomi encourages her and challenges her and coaches her and prepares her. You see, your destiny is usually just around the corner. But you need to know that destiny doesn't do home visits. You've got to go out and get it. You have to chase your destiny. Destiny is about everyday thinking, speaking, and doing, and going, and making it happen. As it turned out, Ruth goes and she starts to work in a field. And Maybe you've read the story before and she finds herself working in a, in a field of, of Boaz. And Boaz is actually a relative of Elimelech, her, her former, Ruth's former father-in-law. You see, remember what I said, nothing just happens. This storm that we're in, this pandemic, this disruption in our life didn't come just to disrupt us. I want you to know it came to clear a path for your destiny. Had Naomi not walked through all of the disruption of the famine and the distress and everything else, had Ruth not walked through this moment as well, the path wouldn't have been cleared for her destiny. I want you to think about today and begin to ask God, God, what is the path that you're clearing for me for my destiny? Now, this is so strange. Here's Ruth working in, in her, basically her cousin's field. And, and Boaz arrives in the field and he greets his workers and, and he says, the Lord bless you. Wouldn't that be nice tomorrow if, as you go to work, your boss came in and said, may the Lord be with you. That would be shocking. 
And they, they returned the reply to Boaz and said, no, 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 may the Lord bless you. And Boaz was overseeing his, as he was overseeing his, his, his workers, he asked, who, who is this young woman? And they said, oh, that, that's the, uh, that's the daughter-in-law of Naomi, your relative. Well, she looks pretty fine. She's working pretty hard. And, and if you know the story, Boaz clears the way. He tells the other workers, don't bother her. Don't, don't literally, don't molest her. Be kind to her. And if she wants a drink, you go get her a drink of water. She doesn't serve you. At the end of the day, she came and she said, Ruth said to Boaz, why have I found favor in your eyes? I'm a foreigner. And Boaz said this, I have been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. And then Boaz says something that's really powerful. This is a blessing. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have taken refuge. This is what happens when you place your life in the destiny that God has for you. You rest under his wings. The Bible says that Ruth gleaned in the field or she worked in the field until evening. And then she went home and, and, and Naomi said, How, where were you? And she said, I was working in the field of Boaz. And she said, the field of Boaz? Well, he, he's, he's a cousin to your father-in-law. And in the meantime, Boaz falls in love with Ruth, and you, you can read the rest of the story, how Ruth and Boaz eventually marry. And let me pick up the story there. Boaz eventually redeems the land. He buys back the land of Elimelech, the land that they thought they had lost. And he returns it to Naomi. He gives it back to her. He becomes Naomi's kinsman redeemer. The Bible in the New Testament says that Jesus is our kinsman, kinsman redeemer. He buys, he's related to us in flesh, and he buys back our life. He, he returns it to us. This is a template for redemption. Ruth and Boaz get married. They, they, bring, they, they bring Naomi into their home, and they give Naomi, what every woman wants, and I know this, grandchildren. And they, they, they come, and nothing will bring more joy to your life. Children are wonderful, but grandchildren are way better because at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, they go home. You don't have to look after them. You just get the fun part as grandparents. You see, the grace and the mercy of God is beyond what we could ever imagine. It's never too late for God to engage you in your destiny. Naomi had nothing. Now she is full. Now Naomi is living in the home of Boaz and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and she has everything at their disposal. Now, the next time she walked through Bethlehem, past the Bethlehem Starbucks, the ladies were different now. They said, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you, Naomi, without a kinsman redeemer. May he be famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life. He will sustain you for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who has given you is, is better than seven sons. And he, she has given birth to your grandson. Naomi, the Bible says, took the child in her arms. She cared for him. And the woman living there said, Naomi has a son. She didn't say Ruth had a son. She said, Naomi, they said, Naomi have a son. And they named him Obed. Now, today I want to assure you of something. I want to assure you that your sacrifices and your difficulties do not go unnoticed by our loving God. He, he totally understands. He, he's a God who feels the pain that we feel. The Bible says he's touched by the feelings of our infirmities or our, our senses, our sicknesses. He's a God of hope and a God of destiny. No matter what situation I've been faced with, God has given me hope and a destiny. 
And I know that God has a destiny for you. He sees your struggles. He sees your pain and he has a barley harvest waiting for you. Now, I want you, I want to read for you just for a moment. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1 is an interesting chapter because it's, it's, it's the beget chapter. It, it's Abraham beget Isaac, Isaac beget Jacob, and la, 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 la. But at the end of this chapter, this is what it says. Remember, remember, Ruth's son was named Obed. And the Bible says this, that Obed's mother was Ruth, and Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. Wow. And David was the follow of, father of Solomon. And it goes all through the genealogies. And then when you get to the end, it says, And Mathan was the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Can you believe that? In the destiny of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is Obed, whose mother was Ruth. God has a destiny. It doesn't matter who you think you are this morning, who other people have told you are. God has an, an extremely exciting destiny for you. If you take a step of faith, if you worship him, if you will say, simply say, this is the reality of my situation. May I challenge you this morning to be obedient like Naomi. Humble yourself like Ruth. Be kind and generous like Bo Go Boaz. Go and gather the seeds that God has for you. Oh, it's going to be work. And if you're empty this morning, God has a barley harvest for you. And it changes everything. Come today. Come to our Father God and say, God, would you show me and demonstrate to me the barley harvest? I want to close today with these words. It's the blessing that Boaz gave to Ruth. And I want to bless you with it today. I bless you with the truth that God has a barley harvest planted for you. He's waiting for you to return to him and walk back into his fields of plenty. And may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whom's wings you have taken refuge. God bless you this morning.